Hey guys, all right, today we're watching another Eastery video. This time, brilliant plans to win World War II. The Soviet plan to win the war in 1942. I don't know exactly how the hell they plan to do that. <laughs> to get their whole front pushed all the way into Germany by 1942, uh, that would have been a absolutely astronomical uh, plan. Uh, I don't near probably nearly impossible, if not completely impossible, to crush the German lines that fast. Uh, giving the Soviets even probably the best uh, advantages in like hypotheses and whatnot. Still, an extremely quick amount of time. But uh, let's go ahead and hear what East what Eastery says about this brilliant plan. 1941, German army had invaded the Soviet Union. The superiority yes, they did. of the Wehrmacht was clear. Encirclement followed encirclement with more than a million Soviet soldiers becoming prisoners of war. The pre-war Soviet units had been decimated and by the coming of autumn, Red Army was mostly made up of newly mobilized troops who had not had the time to receive full training. At the same time, the Germans prepared for a knockout punch directed at the Soviet capital. Boom. Their armored spearheads had moved forward, but near the gates of Moscow, they had exhausted their offensive capabilities. It seemed that the war was decided and it will end in 1942 with the victory of the Soviet Union. Welcome to the brilliant plans to win. So was this plan um, another idea, I guess, in terms of getting a technical victory is were the Soviets just planning on doing a uh, having a successful enough uh, offensive to where they can get Hitler to agree to a peace treaty and leave Soviet lands? That's the only other way I could see them getting victory in 1942. World War II. In these areas, we will examine four brilliant plans to win World War II with cunning strategies and see why they failed. This episode is about the Soviet plan to destroy the Army Group Center during the winter of 1941. So why, despite the German successes, would the Red Army win? In autumn 1941, the Germans had calculated that the Red Army was on the brink of collapse and had taken a gamble with their attack ah, yes, in Moscow. The, the math However, adds up. due to logistical bottlenecks, steady stream of Red Army reinforcements and the coming of the Russian winter, their drive was halted on the approaches to Moscow. Now, German Army Group Center found itself near the Soviet logistical and industrial centers, but at the end of its own supply lines. It was exhausted from months of fighting and with a front line too long to be held with existing troops. The German winter equipment was still in the rare areas, being unable to pass through logistical bottlenecks. And remember, winter was already here. The German troops could not advance and... Back when Game of Thrones was good, before it turned... Before it got corrupted. Ah. Oh, the good days. The good days when you were excited for an epic fantasy show. Ah. Oh. Enough to bring a tear to my eyes. Staying on their present position was too dangerous. So the most sensible solution seemed to pull back and reduce the length of the front and supply lines. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, that's what you should do if your line is overextended. Get yourself into a position where they can't flank you. However, the Germans lacked the means to transport back all their equipment and a lot of heavy weapons would have to be left behind, drastically reducing their future capabilities. Even more, the men lacked winter clothing and a prolonged exposure to the cold during the retreat could have caused large amounts of weather casualties and could have disastrous effect on the morale. 130 years ago, Napoleon had lost his fortune during the retreat from Moscow, and the German army was in danger of doing the same. But what if the Germans would stand and fight? They could overcome their lack of manpower and winter clothing by concentrating their defense in the villages, thus creating a network of strong points. In order to successfully attack, the raid army needed heavy weapons, tactical skill, and air superiority. However, many of the guns lost in summer had still to be replaced. Most of the officers and coming in summer, 1942, a heavy artillery uh, howitzer. I'm just gonna use howitzer as a general artillery name because it's the only one I know. Coming summer of 1942. 
to a Soviet front line near you. I don't know where I was going with that. Soldiers had been recently deployed and lacked necessary skills and combat experience, and the Germans still had a firm grip of the sky. Attacking fortified positions would be suicidal with. <laughs> God damn it, Easter. Suicide. Also suicide. These conditions, let alone in deep snow and freezing temperatures. But the Red Army could adopt a different approach. At the start of the battle, the Soviets did not have a large numerical superiority. But as the time progressed, more and more soldiers were finishing training. The length of the front had left large gaps between the German strongpoints and the Red Army could move some units into the German rear. Meanwhile, other units would encircle and block off the Germans on the front line. When the exploiting force would reach the vital German logistical infrastructure, it would cause large portions of the German front to be pulled back and be threatened with destruction. Eventually, most of the army group center could be destroyed in this fashion, and then the Germans would not have enough troops to mount a decisive offensive in the summer of 1942. Not gonna happen. No, if they nope. couldn't win the war in 1942, then they couldn't do that at all, as later the Red Army would become much stronger, and the German supply situation... I like this graph. That's a cool graph. I like graphs sometimes. If, the, if it's a very simple graph that doesn't have me do a lot of work to understand it, I like it. Even more serious. In the first half of the... As a, that's kind of what a graph is supposed to be like. But anyways, that was a very nice December, graph. December, the Soviets put their theory to the test. They counterattacked by moving their forces into the gaps between the advancing German formations. In the south, this resulted in the encirclement of several German divisions. Threatened with being cut off, the Germans fell back. They lacked the time to evacuate all of their equipment, and a lot of it had to be abandoned. The Soviet plan was working, and the Red Army seemed to have a chance to destroy Army Group Center and decide the outcome of the war. For this, the next step was crucial. The Soviets had several options. They could make a stop to resupply their armies, or they could put their forces in one place for a concentrated attack. These steps need- Which one uh, causes us to lose the most amount of lives? Plan B? All right, plan B. time, and Stalin decided that it was more important not to give the Germans an opportunity to rest and reorganize. Therefore, the attacks were Old to meme. be continued without resupply and divisions moved forward without proper ammunition. The army marches on its on Soviet to help patriotism. The armies to advance. All armies on the central part of the Soviet German front were ordered to attack. The Germans weren't strong everywhere, and inevitably, some of their aid army units would find a weak spot and break through. When the Germans would pull back in order to avoid encirclement, the constant pressure would not allow them to stop the retreat, meanwhile pinning down their reserves in less threatened sectors. The concentration of the German troops was the strongest on the Moscow direction. The Germans decided to pull them back on a shorter position. During the retreat, Soviet forward elements had moved behind the German lines and were now in position to cut off the only major road supplying part of the German 4th Army. The Soviets chose to pass this opportunity for a bigger encirclement. They directed their forward elements towards Vyazma in order to cut off supplies for both the German 9th and 4th armies. German 4th Army managed to finish the retreat and the central part of the front solidified. The line was still made up of strong points, but there was enough of them to cover most of the roads. Larger Soviet formations were therefore unable to bypass them, and the only way forward was through German strong points. The prospect of Soviet attacks here was not promising. Having created a semblance of a solid line in the center, the Germans decided it was time to cling to their positions and retreat was declared to be not an option. This strategy Built snowman. worked well in the central part of the front, where there were reserves to counter Soviet breakthroughs. But on the flanks, where German troops were sparse, implementing this strategy would probably end up with these units being easily bypassed and encircled. Soviet advance towards Vienna. Vyazma continued with their forward elements crossing the Moscow-Warsaw highway. The Germans had fortified the villages surrounding the road and used the mobility provided by the highway to sever the Soviet attempts to resupply the forward units. Without them, the Soviet forces in the German rear lacked the capacity to take the key railway hub. Meanwhile, in the north, the Red Army managed to find a gap in the German lines and broke into their rear areas. The Germans did not pull back from their frontline positions, which weakened the supply situation of the Soviet units in the rear, but at the same time allowed them to encircle the frontline units. They could choose between destroying the German 23rd Corps or cutting off the railway, supplying parts of the German 9th Army. They chose to go for the bigger target, but were unable to cut off the railroad due to lack of supplies and German reinforcements. 
Further north, the German formations were located sparsely and they attempted to hold their positions in accordance with the Führer's orders. The Red Army advanced, encircling and destroying most of them. In Andreapol and Toropets, they managed to capture large amounts of German food and military stocks and used them to supply their troops, pushing onwards until their units had been spread too thin to continue the advance. After the immediate danger had passed, the Germans regrouped and closed the gap, thus weakening the Soviet supply situation to the point the Soviet units in the German rear were unable to pose a serious threat to German communications. South of Lake Ilmen, the German units managed to avoid destruction and establish an effective circular defense. Nevertheless, the Red Army had cut the land-based communications to 100,000 German troops. Luftwaffe was able to supply these units by air to keep them fighting and prevent them from surrendering. Oh. Although the Red Army had attempted some follow-up attacks in the next months, by February the strengths of the Red Army and the Wehrmacht had become even. The German central defenses proved too formidable for the Red Army to infiltrate, and on the flanks where the Soviet units had broken into the German rear, their supply was made inadequate by German strongpoints, and they were unable to seriously threaten the German lines of communications. Both sides had suffered heavily from the fighting and the elements. From the beginning of January till the coming of the spring thaw in April, the Germans had lost more than 300,000 men, a lot of them so due to the effects so of the weather. The Soviets who were on the attack and therefore more exposed to the elements had suffered more than twice the German casualties. With the coming Jesus of spring, Christ. the Germans had regained their ability to maneuver. They reconnected the encircled troops with the main front line and destroyed the undersupplied Soviet formations in the rear areas, thus solidifying their defenses. During the following year, the Soviets attempted to destroy the salient several times but their efforts did not succeed. It was only after the defeat in Stalingrad that the German troops were forced to abandon the salient. Why did the Soviet plan fail? First, the German command managed to assess the situation correctly and decided not to make a full Possibility of destruction of army group center, ah, oh, yes, of course, instead, of course. But instead took a more risky approach to stand- What is less risky? Honestly, yeah, kinda. Uh, that, that would be correct. Because in retreat, you obviously are vulnerable in a bit because you're focusing on moving while also still trying to... You're focusing to on the way I look at it uh, when you're retreating is you're focusing on too many things at once if you have an actively pursuing enemy. Uh, you have an enemy actively pursuing you. You have to focus on getting your supplies out, your men out, while also still holding up a decent enough position to fight back the approaching enemy so that you can retreat. Well, you can't really dig in and fight uh, while retreating. That's, that de destroys the purpose of retreating. So standing in fight means you're digging into a position and you're waiting for the enemy to come to you. So yeah, that's less risky for a loss of life. Stand and fight. This did not allow to inflict heavy damage on the German forces during the retreat. Second, the Soviets thought that the Germans were about to break and instead of choosing a less rewarding approach by encircling smaller German formations, they took a riskier approach, attempting yeah. to destroy all of them in a single deep encirclement, which ultimately failed. This limited the amount of casualties they inflicted on the army group center. Third, although the roads were filled with snow and movement of troops and supplies was slowed down considerably, traveling by air was as fast as ever. German superiority here gave them the final advantage. Luftwaffe <laughs> was able to interdict Soviet breakthroughs in threatened sectors, keep the encircled troops fighting through air supply missions and thwart the Soviet attempts to deploy troops behind the German lines through airborne operations. In the next winter, history repeated itself. Germans had once again made significant gains, but when the winter came, they were stopped before their objectives. But by this time, the Soviets had learned their lessons. Instead of attempting to cut off the whole exposed force, they concentrated their assets against a small part of it. After careful preparations, they went on an offensive and cut off the German 6th Army. The Germans attempted to use the proved tactics for bait retreat and attempted to set up air supply. However, this time there were too many troops in the pocket and the dominance of the air was contested. The resupply effort failed and the German troops were forced to surrender. The winter campaign of 1942 decided the outcome of the war. So technically, the Soviet plan succeeded, but only a oh, year later. Okay, if you if look at it that way, yeah. Other plans to win World War II, you can check them out here. Or if you want to know more about the context of...
that was a good video. I love E Street. Uh, he, he provides some excellent... Uh, the, the way he provides the information of battles, I really like the style that he goes for. Because he does it in a style that like not really anyone else does, in my opinion. I, I think the closest that other people do, similar to Eastery here, would probably be Armchair Historian sometimes. And even then, he does a closer look on the movement like the individual battles sometimes but i think armchair historian is the closest to eastery style um yeah i just really like his style um i mean i like most of nearly all uh history youtubers uh styles they all do a really good job otherwise you know they wouldn't be as you know big as they are uh <laughs> but yeah um Soviet side of World War II is definitely a, uh, on the Western side. It's not really talked about too much, mainly because to give some context and because I know a lot of people get upset or seem to get upset when you tell them like, yeah, no, this stuff isn't talked about in American schools or, or whatever. And it's like, and then people from across the world are like, what? Why don't you talk about this? The reason it's not talked about is because when you're studying history, you're mainly, typically, what schools do is they have you, from my understanding, they have you focus, at least from my perspective as a student, mainly because I am not yet a history teacher. Um, I'm just a historian at the moment. Um, so I, I can't really speak too much on the teaching side of things, despite I, I have some experience, uh, being a teaching, teaching assistant before. Um, but from what it seems like when you talk about war, especially World War II, the focus for American schools is obviously on the American side, because that's what affects a modern American politics. That's what affects modern America, the, the reaper, the the events of World War II and America's role in World War II affect the modern day. Uh, so we don't need to really... You would need to be in a dedicated history class. You'd have to be in the history field to then learn the Soviet side of things because for general education... They, uh, the average person does not need to know uh, what... Now, obviously, compared to maybe those studying... The Russians watching this that studied World War II in their general education classes, like in the Russian equivalent of American high school or whatever, obviously, your studying of Soviet... The Soviet side of things is way more in-depth than I have ever received. Because the Soviet side of things is what affects your modern day. Um, so, that's why you study it. Like, I guarantee you do not learn nearly as much as the Americans do, general Americans do, about the American parts of World War II. So, you know, the, it's the same for everyone. It's just what the schools, what the countries focus on studying in their general education, blah, blah, blah. Probably poorly explained, but yeah, that's why I don't really know much about the Soviet side of things, because American and American classes don't really teach it much. Um, and also, I don't even, and because of the size of the university I go to, they they do not have a Soviet history class either, or I think there is a Russian history class, but not a Soviet one. And it's, like, only offered once a year, I think. I don't know. Uh, I think I only saw it once. I didn't see it when in this signing up for spring semester classes. Anyways, I'm talking way too much. Uh, that was the brilliant plans to win war World War II, Soviet plan, uh, by Eastry. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.